And this book is one that she wrote for Iowa. She wrote these books for many other states. And in fact, she edited all of the books for all of the states in the United States in regard to the status of homemakers, the primary subject which she will address this morning. I'm going to do something I've never done before. I've introduced Roxanne on a number of occasions, and it appears as if we've just met and seem to get along all right. And as a matter of fact, we met some 17 years ago when Roxanne married my brother. <laughs> and one of the first things I learned about Roxanne from Jim was, do you know what she did? She put the TV <coughs> dinners in the oven in the carton. <laughs> And she had a perfectly good reason for doing that because it didn't, as she pointed out, say on the box that it didn't say not to put them in, in the cotton. <laughs> and I'd, I'd like to share, if I may, and I hope I don't embarrass Roxanne, something of the private person, a very special person, a very devoted parent, a very wonderful member of our family. Uh, if you can imagine, her taking the time to knit individual knit, she knits, individual Christmas ornaments for her nephews and nieces and children. Uh, she takes so much time in remembering birthdays and occasions, and not only family members, but I recall sitting in talking with Roxanne at their home one afternoon, and a woman called a stranger who was very much concerned about a red bug on one of her African violets. And she knew Roxanne raised African violets. And uh, it was an urgent matter to this woman. It became an urgent matter to Roxanne. I don't know what happened, but I know Roxanne flew out of the house and went across town to find out whatever it was that red bug was on that leaf. Uh, and she's responding always to concerns of, of people. And it's uh, been a rare privilege, great fun, as you can imagine, to, to know her in, in the close way in which we've been able to know each other in the last 17 years. So the public figure and the private figure, a person of keen insight and kindness, impeccable uh, integrity, it's a great, great pleasure uh, to introduce Roxanne Conlon. Thank you very much. Let me, let me first point out to you that the cartons on TV dinners now say, remove from carton. <laughs> so I must not have been the only one who did that. She, there are other stories that Judy could tell, and, I, and I'm very grateful for her reservation in that regard. <laughs> One of the nice things about marrying my husband, James, was getting to know Judy. And uh, he, he's, uh, of course, a nice person in his own right, but uh, it has been a great pleasure. Before I begin my remarks today, I'm obliged to say to you that in the event I should happen to express an opinion, it is my own and not necessarily that of the administration that I serve, at least uh, for a time. The, uh, <laughs> Uh, the topic, of course, is the law and the family after equality. I'm sure that it has been remarked today that uh, our struggle for equality may have su sustained some setbacks in the uh, recent elections. I think, however, that, uh, that those setbacks, if any, are temporary and that we need to continue to consider the, the uh, importance of the family and the laws that affect the family. The area that I'm assigned is, of course, a very broad one. I think that it would be appropriate for a three-hour course in law school, but we don't have that kind of time. The law obviously affects the family in many, many different ways. Um, domestic relations is the obvious one. Qualifications for marriage, how old you have to be, what sex you have to be, um, <clears throat> uh, the requirements, uh, the requirements. I'm not bitter. I want you to know that I'm not bitter. <laughs> Uh, I was on Wednesday, but I have uh, recovered. <laughs> the uh, requirements for dissolution of marriage, for breaking up a family, uh, even, the, even the law of torts, torts being third-party injuries, is a, affects the family. Um, in the area, for example, of consortium. Uh, when I was in law school, we used to call consortium uh, society, services, and sex. And that is, uh, you can sue somebody for damaging the family relationship in that, in that way, in some states. 
not at all. Uh, funding for various programs, funding for displaced homemakers, funding for battered women's shelters, funding for childcare, those things all affect the family. Juvenile law obviously affects the family. Uh, tax law affects the family. I'm sure that you're all familiar with, for example, the marriage penalty that applies to people who earn roughly equivalent salaries if they, if they marry. They pay more taxes than they would if they simply lived together or didn't even like one another. Um, and of course, there's a, there is a good deal more, and we will have an opportunity this afternoon to discuss whatever your particular concerns are. I, however, am going to focus on the traditional family, the, the family that we think of, that at least some of us think of as the ideal model. I think particularly now we need to pay attention as we may as we may, unless we're very careful, find the ideal family, the mandated form. However, um, that family structure, the traditional family, presents the most legally unequal and unsafe form for women. The tradition, when I speak of traditional family, obviously I'm talking about the husband, who is the wage earner, the exclusive wage earner, the wife as a full-time homemaker, and of course 2.7 children. Um, I'm going to look at the current law and suggest some changes that may, that may help those who choose to, to uh, follow the traditional model. Existing statutes and existing case law provides neither economic nor legal security for people who choose to be full-time homemakers. While on the one hand, they are often told, we are often told as women, that homemaking is the most important and satisfying of career choices, we find on the other hand gaps and pitfalls in the law which indicate that society does not truly value the homemaker's labor. It may be helpful, some of you, those of you who have heard me speak before uh, have heard this particular uh, historical perspective, but I think it's important that we all start from roughly the same place. Uh, and a historical perspective is sometimes very valuable for that purpose in terms of the legal status of women. At the time that our Constitution was being drafted, it was necessary, unfortunately, to find, develop a legal status for the condition of slaves. It was for our forefathers not a difficult task. They looked to and modeled the legal status of slaves after the legal status of married women. Married women until uh, the mid 19th century in this country were total legal non-entities. Besides not having the right to vote, women could not own land, they could not make a contract. They had no right to their own earnings in the event they were employed outside of the home. They had no right to support in the event of a divorce, no right to the custody of their children after a divorce. In fact, the common law presumed that a married woman acted only at the direction of her husband. If she committed a crime in his presence, he could be tried and convicted of that crime. A little ironic justice there. <laughs> That's changed, perhaps not as much as you, as you may think, but it has changed. The legal status of homemakers often is indistinguishable from the legal status of all women, whatever their occupations. Homemakers are, however, non-earners, and therefore, in a society that tends to assign human value based on the amount of income one generates, homemakers are perceived as without value. I'm going to give you some examples of the kinds of laws that exist in various states and impact married women, particularly those who choose to be full-time homemakers. I'm going to start with the law of the state of Georgia. We all know somebody from Georgia. And uh, the domestic relations code of the law of Georgia begins with these words. The husband is the head of the family and the wife is subject to him. Her legal existence is merged in the husband's except in so far as the law recognizes her separately for her protection, for her benefit, or for the protection of the public morals, in case she should go into prostitution or something. In any event, that is the law of the state of Georgia, the 1980 law of the state of Georgia. What does it mean? It means in Georgia that the husband has the absolute right to regulate the family finances. It also means that the house in which the family resides, without regard to whose name is on the title, without regard to who's making the payments, belongs exclusively to the husband. Um, in Arkansas, 
the husband has a right not only to regulate the family finances, but also to regulate visitors to the household. Married women in Arkansas who wants to have somebody over for coffee um, should phone up and get the permission of her husband to do so. Iowa and 41 other states are, <clears throat> are what are called common law property states. Basically, it was separate property states. It basically means that the earner of the income is the owner of the income. For women who are full-time homemakers in the common law property states, they are non-earners and non-owners. Um, that gives rise to the, to the concept that we hear bandied about a, a, a bit by, uh, by those who oppose uh, equality for women. Uh, the concept that women who are full-time homemakers are entitled to rely upon their husbands for support. Uh, that, of course, is a cherished myth. It, uh, it's, never, it's never been possible to enforce the right to support in an intact marriage. That's where the parties are living together. The leading case in the area, can you all see me? I'm, well, I, I'm not going to be able to grow any taller, so I'm... <laughs> this, can I put this down possibly a bit there? Okay. The, the, the leading case in the area is one called McGuire versus McGuire. Uh, it's a 1953 Nebraska Supreme Court case. The parties had been married for 34 years. The husband was 80, the wife was 66. He had several thousand dollars in the bank. He had several hundred thousand dollars worth of property. However, he wanted to keep it all. Uh, for the last eight years, he had not given his wife one dime. No new clothes, except he did apparently buy her cor a coat at some, at some point in this, in this uh, saga. Um, they, had, uh, they lived in uh, what amounted to a shack. The furniture was shabby. The uh, furnace didn't work. They drove a 24-year-old automobile without a working heater. And on top of everything else, they had outdoor plumbing in Nebraska. Mrs. McGuire um, apparently uh, decided to enforce what Phyllis Schlafly calls the wonderful right to support. So Mrs. McGuire went to the district court and the lower court, the district court, gave her $50 a month to meet her own needs, um, ordered him to get a better source of transportation, fix the furnace, and so on. The Supreme Court of the state of Nebraska reversed, saying as long as the parties are living together, the purpose of the marriage is being served. Public policy requires such a holding. There is your wonderful right to support, and there is no case to the contrary. I choose this one, of course, because it's very dramatic. But uh, in November of 1979, this exact principle was restated in a case called, called Goldstein versus Goldstein. The wonderful right to support does not exist. A woman who is a full-time homemaker is absolutely subject to her husband's benevolence. As long as he's benevolent, everything's fine. But if he decides to give his wife, a full-time homemaker, of $10 a, a month to meet her own needs, there is not a court in this nation that will interfere with his decision in that regard. There are also a couple of states that have a form of property ownership called tenancy by the entireties. Um, I was not one of them. It was, it was abolished in this state some time ago. But there are still states that, that have this particular form of ownership. It is available only to married couples. Um, and in such states, it is assumed unless there is a very clear statement to the contrary that all property owned by a married couple is owned in tenancy by the entireties. What it, what it means is that both spouses own all of the property and when one spouse dies, their surviving spouse is the owner of 100% of, of the property. There is, however, a little catch in that. While the parties survive, only the husband has the right to manage such jointly held property, and only the husband has a right to the income from such property. Let me tell you that Massachusetts and North Carolina both have those kinds of laws so that you can avoid living there. Um, <laughs> domicile is another very important legal concept. It determines where you uh, vote, where you pay taxes, where you can go to state-supported institutions, and, and for most people, domicile is reasonably enough where you live, but for many women in about half the states in this nation, unfortunately, probably also Iowa, um, the domicile of a married woman is where her husband lives. 
without regard to where she lives. Um, let me give you an example of how that works. A family living in Minneapolis, Minnesota, father deserts the family and moves to Missouri, another place you ought to avoid living if you can at all, because Missouri has a law that says basically it is the duty of a wife to follow her husband wherever he may lead. And if she fails to do that, he may sue her for divorce on the grounds of desertion. That is, he leaves and she deserts. So here is this woman and her family in Minneapolis, Minnesota, who is supposed to be in Missouri, but she's not ever been in Missouri, but she is by operation of law a legal resident of that state. And because she's never been there, she's subject to suit for divorce on the grounds of desertion. Now, that is not the only area wherein the concept of domicile adversely affects women. In 1972, a woman in Georgia was denied the right to vote because she registered where she lived and uh, her husband lived elsewhere. I don't know who she was going to vote for in 1972. It probably wouldn't have mattered, but we do tend to treat, uh, <laughs> treat the franchise uh, rather seriously. Social Security is another area that treats all women unfairly, whether they are full-time homemakers or work outside the home for income. In terms of Social Security for full-time homemakers, access is through their husband's fund and in no other way. In no other way. I just recently got a letter from a woman who is a farm woman, uh, married 39 years, and, she, and it's a two-page letter, and in the letter she goes uh, through the kinds of duties that she has performed on the farm over the 39-year period. Um, the woman is very ill. She needs surgery. She determined to her great chagrin that the surgery will require of her that she no longer work. She cannot work. She is going to be totally disabled. She will get no Social Security benefits. If her husband was the one who was totally disabled, both spouses would be eligible to receive Social Security. But because it is her, neither of them get any benefits. That's also true in terms of retirement. Um, and of course, women who are full-time homemakers have, have, um, if, have to be married at least 10 years in order to get any benefits of any kind from the Social Security system. It used to be 20. It's changed only recently. In terms of divorce, um, that can be a major tragedy for all the parties involved, but it is particularly tragic often for the non-earning spouse, the economically dependent spouse. Let, let me first talk for a moment about alimony. I think it's important to, to get a handle on what it is, what alimony really is, and how it is utilized in, a, in this state. Um, there is a, a notion afoot that uh, formerly married women live oddly and comfortably on the earnings of their former spouses. Um, we, we decided at one point to try to check that out here in Iowa, and um, the Iowa Women's Caucus Research and Education Center sent volunteers into every courtroom in this state to read divorce decrees to find out who was getting what. And what we found was shocking. Ninety percent of the divorces that in this state in 1973 resulted in no alimony of any kind, not one dime. Even in the 10% of cases in which alimony was awarded, it was not enough to live on. It was $127 a month. Even in 1973, that wasn't much money. Um, it is, of course, true in Iowa, and has been for some years, that alimony is equally available to both spouses. In fact, the first case in which a man was awarded alimony in the state was 1920. The figures for the, in terms of alimony for the nation are much similar to those in Iowa. Obviously. A, a woman who is a full-time homemaker and who, who gets a divorce, and Iowa is, of course, a no-fault state in Iowa, um, any marriage can end at any time um, on the option of only one spouse. What you have to show in Iowa is an irretrievable marital breakdown. Um, that can be shown by just one spouse saying, I'm, I'm done with this marriage, basically. That doesn't take much of a showing. We we are um, we've, we've we've long since left the uh, the area of fault divorce, and so a married woman who's a full-time homemaker, and this sometimes happens, uh, the husband comes home from the office at five o'clock and says, uh, "I'm done now being married to you," packs his clothes and goes, and the wife who doesn't want a divorce 
who has done absolutely nothing to deserve a divorce will find herself divorced and you know, cast out, cast out often without any of the tools necessary to fend for herself, for her own survival and that of her children. In the area of property division, we have other problems. A divorced woman often finds herself without support and without access to the family's property, the property that's been acquired in the course of a marriage. In several states, not Iowa, but in several states, the courts have no right to divide property held in the name of only one spouse. Therefore, an earning spouse can invest all the family income in real or personal property titled in his name or her name alone, and upon divorce, the court cannot award any part of that property to the, to the homemaker, and it happens all the time. And even if she does have title, even if she somehow gets title to property, she may not get the property. When property is purchased by the earning spouse and put in the name of the homemaking spouse, the courts have found that the earning spouse is the owner. There's a case that I call the cookie jar case, which illustrates this, uh, this problem. Indeed, the, the wife had saved money from her household allowance and purchased stocks with, that, with what she had saved um, from the household allowance. And she was apparently very good at it because the stocks just increased dramatically in value. Upon divorce, the stocks were declared to be the property of the husband because he, she used his earnings for the initial purchase. A couple of Iowa cases in this area that are not very encouraging either. A case in Iowa where the earnings of a woman from keeping borders and, um, and uh, selling eggs and in other ways connected with her husband's farm were, were held to be his earnings. In another case, the wife literally ran the farm for 18 years. She, her husband was physically disabled, bedridden. And upon his death, the court held that all of the income and all of the acquisitions for that 18 year period were his. Child custody is another area of, of divorce law that, that's, uh, that can uh, create tragedies uh, for both spouses. We're accustomed to uh, thinking of the marital or the mother's preference as an unfortunate aberration. And it is in my view. I think that it's uh, silly for the courts to uh, think that, the, uh, that a particular parent is better at parenting because uh, she's a female. That just isn't always true. But there is another kind of tragedy that we have created as a result of the abolition of the mother's preference, and that is among the factors that the court is supposed to look at is who can provide the best financial support for the child. The non-earning spouse often finds herself in a battle with the earning spouse to show that she can be not only a full-time parent but also earn a lot of income so she can compete directly with her former husband in terms of custody of the children. Um, I, don't know the, I don't know how to correct that. I think it's also important to note that all marriages end all marriages end, either by divorce or separation or by death. It is the homemaking spouse who is most seriously disadvantaged at the end of a marriage. A homemaker widow may be required to pay state or, an, or federal inheritance taxes on jointly held property because of her non-earning status. She is ineligible for Social Security in her own right and may not have access to her husband's pension. Proof of the inadequacy of our current Social Security and pension system is the fact that three million elderly women live in abject poverty. Numerous solutions have been proposed to alleviate these kinds of problems. Many of those solutions are unworkable. Um, contracts between the parties to a marriage which attempt to establish duties and responsibilities are unenforceable in every state. They may be useful for delineating expectations, but they are not enforceable. And I tell you frankly, I'm not sure we would want them to be enforceable. Um, there are also practical difficulties inherent in the proposals to pay homemakers a salary, principally the fact that the earning spouse may not have enough money to pay the homemaking spouse. There are, however, a number of available alternatives to reduce or eliminate the current legal and economic inequalities for women who are full-time homemakers. Passage of the Equal Rights Amendment would have been nice, and passage of the Federal Equal Rights Amendment will have, I think, a very salutary effect on the rights of full-time homemakers. 
We can also approach it, of course, on a, on a statute by statute legislative reform basis. It has been suggested that another thing that we could do is import existing partnership law into the domestic uh, relations area. And the last thing I'm going to suggest is a community earnings affidavit, which I will, which I will explain. The Equal Rights Amendment um, offers a promising, though somewhat limited, solution to the legal disadvantages of homemakers. Passage would require state legislators to examine laws and practices which discriminate against homemakers and against all women. Statutes which treat women unfairly are directly traceable to the presumption of economic dependence. They are an unfortunate manifestation of the real values historically attributed to homemaking. The Equal Rights Amendment, while not a panacea, would require re-examination of all these statutes and all the case law and of the underlying presumption that homemaking is without economic utility. In a case decided in Pennsylvania after the passage of the State Equal Rights Amendment, the court held that the unpaid services of a homemaker must be accorded equal value with those of the wage earner. Such a result could be anticipated nationally after passage of the Federal Equal Rights Amendment. In the meantime, however, because state legislators make the law with respect to marriage, divorce, and inheritance, reform can be approached on a section-by-section -section basis, um, piecemeal. Changes can be sought in individual statutes to provide for fair treatment of homemaking and to abrogate the remaining vestiges of the common law mistreatment of women. In terms of the partnership law area, I think this offers one of the most exciting opportunities to have a meaningful impact on the rights of women who choose to be full-time homemakers. Partnership law can be easily adapted to the marital relationship. A whole body of statute and case law exists, which could be imported just nearly completely into this area. Um, and it would have a, a very good effect because, you know, a, when you set up a partnership, one spouse or one person, two partners, let us say, or three or five, some people bring into the partnership expertise, some bring in kind services, then some bring money. And the courts have no difficulty at all in working out the equities between the parties in the area, in the business area of partnership law. Um, a Tennessee lawyer, his name is Bonnie Cowan, has proposed a simple plan to provide substance to the rhetoric concerning the value of homemaking. Married taxpayers would be required to sign an affidavit attached to a joint income tax return. That affidavit, on that affidavit, the parties would swear that the income reported on the form is jointly attributable to the efforts of both spouses. Now, I happen to think that's true in the traditional family. I happen to think that the income reported on the form is, in fact, attributable to the efforts of both spouses. And to swear to that might have an, a, a very overarching effect on the laws with respect to uh, homemakers. It creates a kind of community earnings system, not in existence anyplace, um, and not comparable to any existing family property system. Let me hasten to tell you that this may be more symbolic than real. Um, but it also is possible that it would give legal credence to the proposition that homemakers contribute equally to the family's economic survival. We have tried, uh, did try for several years to get a joint earnings affidavit uh, attached to the Iowa income tax return. And uh, it was sent, that bill was introduced periodically and it was sent to uh, you know, the Agricultural Committee and to the uh, uh, I can't think where all it went. It sort of made its way around all the committees, and it never, never made it to the floor. I'm not sure if it ever will make it to the floor, but it, is, it does give us something to think about, and some, uh, it, it would be something that I think might have uh, an impact on the, on, the, on the daily lives of women who are full-time homemakers. I think it's possible that that would give them access to credit in their own names. I think it is clear that it would make the standard for property division 50%. And a number of other possibilities exist. One other possibility that, that uh, I would mention is, the, uh, uh, is a making homemaking, child rearing, child care, um, similar under the law to, uh, to treating women who are in that capacity and who for whatever reason need to go back into the labor market as though they were returning veterans uh, would be 
would be one way to really create some fairness. You know, when, when a, a person serves our country in, the, in a military way, his employer is required to keep his job or her job open for the period of time in which military service occurs. Certain benefits accrue to that person, um, including uh, you know, five extra points on the, on the civil service test and things of that sort. If we value the rearing of children, and we purport to, then why are those who are charged by society with the duty of carrying out that role so treated so adversely under the law? I think, again, this is, I recognize that this is a relatively radical proposal. I do not expect to see it in my lifetime. But again, it is something, uh, it is something to uh, think about. The problem is that women who do exactly as society has dictated for centuries, who marry, who bear children, and who have careers as full-time homemakers often find that legally and economically the services they have performed are completely disregarded. They count for nothing. No one, no one suggests that the love and care of a wife and mother ought to be totally measured in dollars and cents. But we must not continue to permit romantic and paternalistic notions about the occupation homemaker to obscure the unique legal and economic dependency of people who choose that career. Thank you.